Hello everyone, my name is Thijmen Schep and I'm going to give you uh, like a half an hour, 25 minutes presentation about the work that I'm doing for the Sherpa project. Um, and uh, originally I had a really big presentation planned, but then I realized all my works are in my own home and I'm giving this talk from my own home. So I'm actually going to give you a small tour of the creations and I've made a small little exhibit right here that we can look at together. Um, so uh, let me start off by sharing uh, my slides. Oh, I don't want to do that. Oh yeah, I can. Yep. Yeah, okay. Here we go. I hope you can all see this. Okay. So first of all, this is a, a, a Sherpa presentation. Uh, Sherpa has received funding from the European Union Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. So uh, very grateful uh, to the European Union for making all this research possible and for looking into all these issues in the first place. Um, so uh, I'm going to go into the Sherpa project a little bit more in, in a second. Um, the agenda for this, this talk is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am so you know, you know who this guy is. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sherpa and AI and how I perceive it because within the Sherpa consortium I am the artist. So that means I have a yeah, rather unique role which is really fun and, and, and great. Um, then I'm going to give you the tour of my creations. I'm, I'm going to show you the exhibit. Um, and uh, then I'm going to just talk about the conclusion and, and uh, yeah, how I look at things and, and what we can take away from all this. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things in the, in the later on. So that's uh, the Smart Water Gun project, uh, the Candle Smart Home project, which is award winning, and uh, one of my latest uh, uh, creations, which is uh, called a Slot Machine for now. It's working progress, but I thought I'd give you a, a, some, some insight into that. Um, finally, there's another project uh, that I have to be able to have time to get into, which is an online creation that measures you, and I'm, I'm going to get into it later. Um, so I don't just want to be talking about my work, which you, which you probably expect, but also want to talk about the ideas behind them a little bit. Um, okay, so about me. So I, I'm the artist of the bunch, uh, but I often call myself a privacy designer and a technology critic when I talk to most people. Um, and that, that, that really opens a lot more doors. Uh, so that means that I'm both interested in, in theory and practice around technology. So on the one hand, I'm a bit of a philosopher and I explore the theoretical issues around technology. And on the other hand, uh, I have a lot of hands-on knowledge. I, I have, yeah, I know how to build things. I enjoy building things. Um, so it's, it's very, uh, you know, I, you could say I'm both a philosopher in a way, like from the humanities perspective and, and the technologist. And that's a really unique position to be in. Um, that's a really strange position to be in because not a lot, of, a lot of people are in that role, having both humanities and technology backgrounds, which means I really get to understand both of these worlds and also, you know, never really feel at home in either of them because I always have this other view. Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a little book about privacy design, so I've, I've been in this subject for a long time. I've studied it, I've, I've taught it, I've taught a class on it, I've set up a class at the uh, practical University of Amsterdam. Um, so that's one side, and uh, the other side is, you, you can say this is the side where it's very much about building things and technology, and, and then of course you have this, this well-known saying, like the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Um, but as a philosopher, I also talk about and think about the issues around technology, how they um, make us feel, what they do to us, how we can understand those in a wider level. And there I very much realized that the opposite of that saying is also true. Like the best way to invent the future is to predict it. If you create a powerful idea, then a lot of people will, will try to make that, right? So both these things, technology and the ideas are very important and they really influence each other. So Sherpa. Um, so Sherpa is uh, a research project by the European Union and uh, it, it basically explores uh, what issues we're going to see around smart information systems towards the year 2025. So it's very forward looking. It tries to ask a lot of people basically their, their thoughts and their opinion and brings all these things together in so-called Delphi studies and things like that. It tries to give us an idea of what, how are people perceiving the future and what are they seeing as the issues that are coming up. Um, yeah. and. Uh, these are very much like, you know, in the group in the subject like education, electricity, grids and healthcare, all these things that you would, you know, there are issues or there are areas of society. As an artist in the group, I look at things a little bit differently, you could say. I'm not so much interested in these these, these areas. I'm, I'm, the question I'm more interested in is, is what does my mom run into? How does my mom think about these things? Like what does the average person 
think about this stuff and how do they, they think about it. By the way, this person is not my mom. Uh, this is uh, created by the, the website thispersondoesnotexist.com, which is a great art project that creates fake uh, uh, people basically using uh, machine learning. Um, so yeah, so my, my point is that the, yeah, for me, it's all about, about people. And of course, these are all fake people again. <laughs> it's amazing how good this algorithm is. So yeah, so the interest of the people and their ideas and their perception of AI, the perception of these technologies, their fears, you know, like the, the, and, and their biases that go into this. People have very strange ideas around artificial intelligence and, and this, uh, this stuff. And people have strong desires that they project onto the technology. You know, they, they want things from it. They want artificial intelligence to do things for them or they, they fear it. There's a lot of um, emotion involved, basically, in this stuff. We, we think of technology as cold logic, and, but it's not. It's very emotional people with emotional ideas. And these ideas have a lot of influence on the technology. So yeah, so, so as an artist, my work is about perception, the perception of artificial intelligence and the perception of these, these ideas with people. Okay, so with that, let's, let's, let's get um, onto the creations. Let's see how much time do I still have. Great, okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of, of things, as I said, and, and the first one I wanna uh, talk, go into is Candle. So Candle is a, a privacy-friendly smart home prototype or a demonstrator. It's a, it's a real system, we're gonna look at it in a second. Um, that is basically a smart home system, as you would expect from you know the commercial parties, how they would build it. Um, and these smart homes aren't exactly you know looked at in a favorable light nowadays anymore. The, the feelings are very diverse. There's some some research that shows that a lot of people are very hesitant to 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 try these things, and and um, they have a lot of trust issues with this technology now. And of course, part of that was like last year we saw this big scandal where. Um, it turned out that Amazon and Google and even Apple had people listening into their voice recordings that they made with these systems. Um, and I think this, this, this appeals to this idea that people increasingly, you know, we're talking about emotion, people are feeling watched more and more. I think that for me is something that really matters. Like it's, you can say that it's irrational or, you know, but people feel that way. They feel more watched. Um, I think they're slowly starting to realize how all of this works. You know, this is about their data not just being you know, sold off, but their data is being judged by algorithms and these judgments are being sold off. Uh, there are these predictions are being made about them. Uh, I think these makes, make people feel even more uneasy, you know, even less, less give them even less the feeling that they have any, any grip on the thing and any overview of what's going on. And rightfully so, like you can imagine like in a smart home, uh, if you have a smart lamp, like you just turn it on off at night and turn it on in the morning. But what also, what, you know, just from that single lamp, you could get someone's sleeping pattern, right? They go to bed at night, wake up in the morning. You can see over time if they sleep well, if they sleep, you know, if they go to bed earlier or not. Um, and of course, this information can then be used to predict uh, things like, um, for example, we know that Alzheimer, your Alzheimer risk is very much dependent on your sleeping habits uh, at younger age. So suddenly your on off light switch is very interesting to an insurer right it might say a lot about you know your chance to get alzheimer later um, and i think th this is the link that people are slowly starting to to make and realize they're starting to realize it's not just about the toggle it's about the predictions and analysis of their data later on um so i think people are not just feeling watched they're feeling judged more and more and that for me is very interesting and, and what i would say is one of the big issues around all this stuff towards 2025 that, People are starting to become aware of what's going on. They're feeling judged and watched. Um, so Candle is, 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 is kind of was an exploration of this idea. Like, do we have to choose between privacy and convenience? As, as is often said, you know, it's often implied. So you can have a smart home, and then you have to give up your privacy. Well, it turns out, no, you, you don't really have to do that. If you design it carefully, you design it well. If you design it with ethics in mind, you can have a system that gives you 90% of the functionality with, you know, uh, 100% of the privacy. So why don't we do that? It's a great idea. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures here, but actually I think we should move to uh, the exhibit and we're going to try it out and see it. Ooh. I hope this all goes well. Maybe it's stuck in the wires. Yep. All right. You can still see me. Okay. So uh, I hope you can all see this. Uh, this is a little exhibit of, of Candle, and Candle is basically uh, the smart home system, and I've asked two artists. This is Dini Basims. She's a jeweler, 
jewelry designer, and this is Jesse Howard. He's a product designer. He's very much into open design. And they've created all these devices. Um, and I can go into that for hours, but I won't. But what's interesting about them, of course, is what Sherpa contributed to the whole project, which was to explore artificial intelligence in your home as a way to protect your privacy. So this whole system has local voice control, fully local voice control. You don't need Apple or Amazon or Google. You can just you know, control these devices with your voice. So you've got simple things like, hey, Snips, turn on the couch light. Setting one of the couch lights on. So that turns on the lights. I think that's kind of easy and understandable. That's what everybody wants, basically. And, and easy. I can say, like, hey, Snips, what time is it? It is 11 minutes past 11. I can set timers. I can do all the things that you can do with a smart home. Uh, but of course, these devices are much more interesting than that. So what I can also do is, this is a CO2 sensor. This measures the CO2 level in your home. And you might want to do that because you, if you sleep poorly, it might be because you have too much CO2 in your bedroom. So my tip is always leave your bedroom door open. Anyway, uh, all these devices are made by Jesse, and they're all easy to open with magnets, so you can look inside them. But more interestingly is that you can do this. You can turn off data transmission. So you can do that with your app or with your, the toggle there on the side. But I can also use my voice to do that. So I can say, hey, Snips, turn off data transmission of the carbon sensor. Data transmission of carbon sensor to off. So, she, so I can use my voice and I can use this in my, my, my hands. Whoop. Um, and uh, yeah, this is like another way of protecting your privacy, but also because you have all this local control, like in my own experience, it, it really helps you with, um, you feel great about, you don't feel watched, so you use it more, right? So I don't feel bad about using, um, you know, turning on my lights or, or opening my doors or turning on the heating or whatever. Uh, because I feel don't feel watched, which is what I want from smart home. So a lot of parties are interested in this. A lot of people are building this system now, which is really great. So this is you know made by some experts, but um, but uh, a lot of you know you, the website helps you build it yourself. So a lot of people are doing that. So that's really a lot of fun. And these are Dini's creations. They have little skirts, so you can hide the screen if you don't want your friends to see the data on your device. So that's another way to protect privacy. But that's not really you know related to the voice control that that Sherpa so so been so great in. Um, okay, so let's let's uh, move on to the next one. I'm looking at my time, and it's probably uh, uh, oh, wait, are you guys even seeing this? Mm, maybe you can see things better now. Okay, so these are the devices. Now I can see what I'm sharing as well, which is nice. And so that's Dini, and that's Jesse. And hey, Snips, turn off the couch light for two seconds. Okay. <laughs> That's going to talk to you. Oops. All right. So the next thing I want to show you is something I'm working on, which is uh, called um, uh, well, it's called the slot machine for now, and it's you know a bit of a pun on on algorithms and how they judge us and how they put us into groups. So it's you know very much a work in progress. So you can see the wires and all that, and it's all not perfect yet, but it gives you an idea. So what this does is, um, and I'd love to have actually get your feedback on that. What this does is. It, it's a pun or a play on the fact that a lot of these algorithms that, that are used to analyze us and to judge us and you know this machine learning stuff is very bad. It's it's you know it's we expect a lot from it and we think it's all neutral and, and great, but in reality these these algorithms make a lot of mistakes. So what this this machine allows you to do is if you think that algorithms are trustworthy, well put your money where your mouth is, right? So you can um, stand in front of it and you can pull the lever. So let's do that. Yeah. And then um, it gives you an out, it, it selects a couple of algorithms that will judge you based on your appearance. So that's what the camera at the top is for. Um, so I can say, am I attractive? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm say I'm, I'm okay looking. Um, am I male, female, or other? Let's say I'm, I'm female. And what's my ethnicity? Well, let's say I'm, I'm black. So the computer will, the algorithms will look at me now. So the camera is, is taking, a, you know, taking a picture of me, and the algorithms are actually judging me right now, and they're checking if what I'm saying is true. So, so am I black? Am I female? Am I okay looking? So I'm being judged on my attractiveness. I'm being judged on my gender. And the, the fun of it is that if I if the algorithm concludes that I'm correct, if it agrees with me, then nothing much happens. But if the algorithm thinks uh, I'm wrong, um, well, then uh, it will uh, have some negative consequence for me. For example, the, the original idea was to spray water onto the person uh, standing in front of it. Uh, if, so then we say you're lying. Um, now I'm kind of thinking of playing with the idea of making it a bit more dubious. 
by uh, asking you to put your identity card here in, in, in this slot here, and then uh, it closes up, and then there will be uh, might be like a, a sander that might sand off the top of your identity card if it decides that you're lying. So the idea is to kind of give you the same sense of being judged wrongly and harshly by an algorithm and that it might limit your chances, which is what a lot of people are experiencing. And then here you are experiencing it yourself as well. So that's what uh, it's a bit of a pun on. I don't know why it's not judging right now, but um, usually it will give you the judgment and you pull it and then, you know, there's a big sound and then it, it'll do the thing. Um, okay, so on to the, the next project. And I think I have to go back to my slides a little bit. Um, yeah. I hope you can all see that again. Yeah, so, so the kind of control all your data is stored locally. And oh yeah, one of the fun things is that this whole system uses um, uh, microphones. Uh, it, the microphone is USB, so you can easily detach it. So I don't know if you can see that here. But I'm just detaching it. And even the microphone is very open. You can look inside of it. I don't know if you can see it in a small window. OK. So the next project. Uh, you see my own home system. So this is my fine dust sensor, and this is my Fine dust, uh, my, my dust air filter. Um, oh, this is also a fun device, the anemone. This is this allows you to turn off the internet of your entire home with a twist of a button, so that a lot gives you more protection. Um, but that's another story. I give you the Voco demo. So yeah, Voco is open source, by the way, so you can totally download it. And of course, the website also mentions that it is you know supported by European Union. Thanks very much for that. And a lot of people are using this because. Voco has now become the de facto voice control system for Mozilla's Web Things gateway, which is you know what we are using here. So um, a lot of more people are doing this now. A lot of people are building it. It's really cool. Okay, yeah. So so that whole snip thing, the whole Voco thing, the whole voice control thing was about um, smart homes becoming like this trust time bomb where people don't trust technology anymore, and we want to avoid that. The next subject is is, is war. So I joined uh, an early uh, session with uh, um, with Sherpa in Brussels. The start of when I joined the project, which was a little bit later than, than the others, um, and it was really fascinating. And and um, there were some really, really really smart people from the, the war sector. You know, it was really fun to talk to, um, and it made me realize that this is uh, you know one of these issues that can become very big because this is about life and death. These are, these are you know. The question of all these algorithms and these systems is how far do you trust them with making decisions? And of course, the, you know, war is the ultimate decision. So there's this device that most people don't know about. Like I have myself have a Samsung smartphone, um, but what people don't realize is that Samsung also makes other devices, which is the Samsung SDRA1. And what this is is um, this is a, a gun. This is a sentry gun. It's Fully autonomous, so it, it actually has built-in software and it can detect enemy combatants and if it you know it can shoot them and, and and kill them if you want to. That's like an option of the system. And this is already for sale, right? So this is used in the border between North and South Korea. It's already there. So a lot of these artificial intelligence issues that we're talking about, they are already there. Right? They are very much here right now. Um, so I wanted to play with this idea that, that you know most people don't realize that it's here and that Samsung makes this already and that these capabilities are here now. Um, so uh, I've created this these this concept of the smart water guns and what these are are uh, toy water guns. Let me see if I can stop sharing the screen again. Yeah. So these are are these uh, water guns um, and. Uh, you know, you can buy these in, in the shops nowadays and look at this thing. This is not just like a normal water gun, you know, this is like, you know, a full on sentry gun. So when I saw these, I was like, oh my God, perfect. Um, and what these have is that I've kind of modified them to, to have artificial intelligence inside of them, or I hate calling it artificial intelligence. I prefer to call it, you know, machine learning or um, what it really is, which is um, uh, statistics on steroids. So these devices use statistic on steroids, and they basically have a camera in the front and uh, a little Raspberry Pi or a mini computer, a couple of choices here. And, um, and it basically blocks the trigger at the back from being able to be pulled if a certain type of, of a group of people is in front of the camera. So this gun is not able to shoot, for example, elderly, or it's only able to shoot the elderly or only 
um, women, for example, so or only cheese. I mean, whatever you can get an algorithm to to decide on to judge, you can you can make it happen. So I could make this gun. To, of course, this, one of the obvious ones is to make a gun that can only shoot attractive people, or you know, should it only shoot ugly people? That's of course all these questions that you get um, uh, when you have this, which is like, should it? You know, yeah. There's a lot of this, when I talk to people about this project, they immediately start thinking along, which is a lot of fun to see how they're like, oh, but it sh should be the other way around, or it should do this. Um, so right now I'm, I'm technically looking into to actually using something that as a nerd I find very interesting, which is the very first Linux smartphone. This is uh, um, the Pine phone. And the goal is to have this all in one system. So this can be um, at the top here. And it's both um, like your display, it shows your, you know, what, you, what you're seeing, it allows you to choose like how the gun operates. And it also looks at, at the front to make the analysis. So that could be a really nice one, all in one solution. This, this project was supposed to be launched actually this summer in exhibit here in Amsterdam about uh, AI issues and ethics. But of course, through the corona, that never happened. Um, but there's actually a TV program that might now want to uh, show them instead. So that's, that could be fun. And the exhibit will just be delayed anyway. So it'll still happen. Um, so yeah, so, so of, but of course, is the obvious metaphor here. Uh, I, I don't like explaining you know my metaphors too much. I've been doing it quite a lot already. but. Um, of course, this is you know a pun on on our childlike uh, perspective on these machine learning technologies, right? How we, uh, um, I think that the Pope once said that the man is a is a technolo technological uh, a god and an, and an ethical uh, child. You know, it's it's uh, yeah, that's very much like here uh, a pun on that. Like we are still children playing with this stuff. We have no idea what we're getting ourselves into. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, up quite quite on the nose, really. But I think it's still a lot of fun, and I'm really looking forward to to actually having kids play with this, making videos with kids playing with this, uh, and, and looking exploring all those scenarios once the gun is uh, is in, out in the world. Um, so yeah, so that's that's just one thing. And then uh, oh, we've got three minutes left. So the last project I quickly want to mention is. Um, uh, is Who Normal Benik, which is a Dutch project I've been doing. I can actually go back to my chill out. All right. Ooh. Here we go. So, uh, Who Normal Benik, this is like you can try it yourself if you want. It's a website, it's a Dutch website right now. And what it does is uh, uh, go to, uh, maybe I can show you. Uh, actually, no, sorry, I should have done that. Uh, one second. I don't know if you can see this. I forgot to add this URL. So now you can see it. So if I share this, you can see the URL. Where you, you could actually try the Dutch version right now. That's, I'm going to make an English version. Uh, that's what uh, Sharp is, is allowing me to do, which is really cool. Uh, and actually, a lot of people are literally like saying, I should do this, like make an English version because it's so much fun. All right, here we go again. I hope you can see that. Yeah, so if you go to this website right now, you can kind of test drive the Dutch version. Um, right now, I'm making an English version, uh, and this is what this website does is basically it's, it's like an online self-test. It's like a quiz, you know. It's it's, it's a quiz slash documentary. So it's it allows you to um, to see literally in your own browser, uh, using your own webcam, how these algorithms are judging you. So you have an algorithm that judges you on your beauty, an algorithm that judges you on your age, and all these things. Uh, these things can now be done in your browser. It's it's really gotten to that level now where this is already you know so easy to. Uh, so possible on mobile phones and all that. Um, so it does that, and it also not just does that, it judges you, but it also shows you how it's judged other people that have done the same test. So you can compare yourself to what is normal uh, according to the algorithm. So you know if most people are you know between the age of, of 30 and 40, then that's normal, and if you're not, then you're not normal. And that will go to your score of whether or not you're normal. You know, if most people are attractiveness-wise a six, uh, then if you're around the six and you're normal, but if you're like an eight, you're too attractive, then you're not normal. Um, so there's a lot of the algorithms in this system, and I don't want to spoil it too much because it's there's it a lot of uh, small jokes in it. Um, but uh, this is gonna gonna be released pretty soon. And one thing that I actually also would love some feedback on, or one thing that I kind of know what I want to do is there's one algorithm that I don't have in there yet, but I really want to have in there, which is an algorithm that uh, predicts your BMI based on your face. So these algorithms exist, and they're used by insurers. And, 
uh, once you have someone's, you know, when you, once you can predict someone's BMI or try to predict someone's BMI, their body mass index from a photo, uh, and you also have their gender, which I also have in the system, and you also know what country they're from, which I can easily get from a browser, you can combine all those into another prediction that's pretty, getting pretty popular, which is uh, how long you will live. So I've actually spoken to people who work at Dutch data brokers who are literally, um, uh, you know, making algorithms like this that try to predict when you will die. And, and that's very interesting to insurers, of course. Um, okay, so let's go to the conclusion. Uh, should we stay there? Okay, so let's go to the conclusion. So I've, I've shown you a couple of works and uh, what's this all about? So for me, all this stuff around, you know, what we're really talking about is artificial intelligence and I hate that word, like I said, but um, it's not just about technology, you know, it's not something that's inevitable and that's happening. It, there's also around this, this shell of, of stories and narratives and dreams and hopes and desires. And you could say that those are more powerful than the AI itself. I, I think that, um, you know, there's literally this week, there was some research that points out that the, the, the advances in, in this stuff aren't really all they're, they're cracked up to be. It's not going that fast, but people expect so much from it. They, they think that, you know, in a couple of years, we'll have self-thinking, uh, um, you know, high level artificial intelligence, we won't, we won't have that for, for a long time. But in the meantime, this idea, this notion of artificial intelligence is wreaking havoc on society. You know, it, it's, it allows people to, to do things and to say, well, you know, we have to innovate, we have to do this now. And it's being used a bit of a, in a wrong way. It's, it's being used as an excuse in a way to, to do things that are, I don't think are always ethical. And that's why Sherpa is so exciting to me, you know, because Sherpa is about uh, not just, you know, inventory, making an inventory of, of these issues, but I think also in its a very existence, talks about this idea that technology is not inevitable, right? Talks about that we can talk about it and, 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 and maybe limit it and, and create limits on the technology as we've always done throughout history. We've always had things, you know, like nuclear energy, maybe not do that so much, you know, like we've always um, took, the sand at the edges of technology. We've always done that throughout history, and that's why we can look back on history uh, and say that technology has brought us a lot of good. That was because we limited it. That was because we we um, thought about it critically. That was because we uh, yeah, uh, did things like Sherpa is doing right now. We research it, we talk to people, and we explore limits. And I think for me, that that's it's, it's very much about hope about, that, that I feel from that because um, it, to me, it's, it's, it shows a different kind of optimism that, I'm, that you hear from Silicon Valley. You know, Silicon Valley has this idea of optimism that just use technology and technology will make the world a better place. Well, I think in Europe and, 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 and critical thinkers, you find this other idea of what I call deep optimism, which is that we can create a better world and technology can definitely be a part of that, but precisely because we think critically about it, because we are not afraid of talking about the downsides as well, right? There are great upsides to the technology there are also downsides, and the sooner we investigate those and understand those, the sooner we can file off those edges and, and make the technology actually work well for us. Uh, so I think that's a narrative that is very much European. European. This, I think, growing understanding that technology is, is political, that it's not something that you can't do anything about, that's inevitable and you can't stop it. Yes, you can, well, maybe not stop it, but you can totally steer it in the right direction. I think we have to do that, and, and that's why I'm really proud to be part of this. Um, so again, <laughs> this project, uh, that was my talk. Uh, this whole thing is supported by European Union. Uh, I, I love how it's given me so much freedom to, to, to join this team and to have you know, my perspective and share it. Um, it's received funding from the EU. Uh, again, EU, <laughs> thank you guys for that. Um, and with that, I kind of want to uh, end my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>